Okay, in this video we're going to look at some results involving differentiability and continuity. So let's just recall that a function is called differentiable at a, b if for all points near a, b we have the following setup. So f of x is equal to the equation of the tangent plane, so in other words the linear approximation of f at a, b, so that's going to be f of a, b, the partial with respect to x evaluated at a, b, times x minus a, the partial with respect to y evaluated a, b, y minus b plus some remainder function. And that remainder function has this property that the limit as x, y goes to a, b of that remainder function over this square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared is zero. So obviously we can calculate this remainder function. It's just going to be the difference in the original function and that linear approximation. Then furthermore, we have this vector version, which extends to Rn really nicely, which is given by f of x is f evaluated at a, then the gradient of f evaluated at a dot x minus a, so that's a vector, plus r of x, and then we have a similar limit. Okay, so I want to prove this theorem twice in this video, once for R2 and once for Rn using vector notation. So for R2, it says that if fxy is differentiable at a, b, then it's also continuous at a, b. So uh, let's go ahead and see what the proof looks like, which is pretty uh, simple, actually. So what we will do is suppose that um, if we set R of xy, equal to um, f of x, y minus this big quantity, so f of a, b plus f sub x evaluated at a, b times x minus a um, plus f sub y evaluated at a, b, y minus b, then we know that the limit as x, y approaches a, b of r of x equals zero. Okay, so that's what we're assuming because that is the same thing as assuming that this thing is differentiable um, at a, b. That's the equivalent definition, or that is the definition, I should say. Now, the next thing we want to do is show that this implies that f is continuous. In other words, we want to show that the limit as x, y goes to a, b of f of x, y equals f of a, b. So that is the definition of f being continuous at a, b. Okay, but notice this thing is the same thing as if we take a difference of these two and get zero. So that limit being equal to a, b is the same thing as subtracting f of a, b from both sides and getting zero, so that's pretty obvious. So this is actually how we're going to do it. Okay, so let's look at this. We've got the limit as uh, x, y uh, goes to a, b of, and I'm going to put an absolute value in here, the absolute value of f of x, y minus f of a, b. So remember that uh, a function tends to zero if and only if its absolute value tends to zero. So we're showing that its absolute value tends to zero. That's going to be a bit simpler in this case. Okay, so notice that uh, this is the same thing as saying that the limit as x comma y goes to a comma b of the absolute value of f of x y minus f of a b over the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared times the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared. So I've just multiplied by one, I've just multiplied by one in this kind of complicated way. Okay, great. Now the next thing that we want to do is notice that this guy right here is really part of this equation that we have. And so let's maybe uh, notice that this thing right here is exactly inside this equation in the following way. So we can distribute these minus signs through and we have that. So 
what we can do is we can replace this thing that I've overlined in purple with this thing in purple parentheses as long as we isolate this on one side of the equation. In other words, we can do that by adding these partial derivatives times um, x minus a and y minus b to the other side of the equation. So I'm going to point that out a little bit more carefully here and then we'll do that. So here we're going to use this fact. And that is that um, fxy minus fab is really equal to r of xy plus f sub x at ab times x minus a uh, plus f sub y evaluated at ab y minus b. So that's what we're about to use, and we're using this equation up here to do that. Okay, great. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this bit of the board, and then I'll rewrite the limit with this equality worked in. Okay, so we just argued what we're going to insert for this thing that's overlined in purple and yellow. Um, built off of this equation. So now let's go ahead and do that. So notice that I'm going to replace this thing with um, r of xy plus f sub x evaluated at a, b times x minus a plus f sub y evaluated at a comma b, uh, y minus b. Good. And then notice that still all over this thing, which is the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared. And then we multiplied by one of those in the numerator as well during our calculation. So we've got something like that going on. Okay, good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this limit up into three fractions based off of each of these and then uh, see what happens to each one. So let's do the one with r of x first. So this is going to be the limit as x goes to a, xy goes to a, b of, so notice we have r of xy over the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared times, we've got one of those on the outside too. But notice that this part of the limit tends to zero and this part of the limit tends to zero. So we've got a limit that's tending towards uh, zero times zero. In other words, everything associated with this part of the bigger limit on top is approaching zero. So we can uh, stop worrying about that R of X term. So now let's look at each of the partial derivatives. I'll clean up this little part of the board so that we can do that. Okay, so we just argued that everything associated with this remainder term goes to zero as we do that, this limit. Now let's look at what's happening to this other bit. So notice with this other bit, we're going to get the limit as xy goes to ab of um, f sub x evaluated at ab times x minus a. And then I'm going to go ahead and let this guy that I introduced in the numerator and that guy that I introduced in the denominator cancel each other. So in other words, I've got the square root of all of this stuff downstairs. I've got the square root of all of this stuff upstairs. I'll just cancel those. And then we can see that this thing is just a number because it's a function that's already been evaluated at something. So that's just a number. And then very clearly as x approaches a, this thing whole, whole thing goes to zero. So in other words, we have this part going to zero. And then for a very similar re reason, just switching a with b and x with y, we have this bit goes to zero also, which makes our entire limit approach zero. So, but since our entire limit approach z approaches zero, that means we have the limit as xy approaches ab of f of xy is equal to f of ab because their difference approached zero. So that means we have that equality in the limit. In other words, f is continuous at ab. Okay, I'll clean up the board and then we'll look at the proof in the vector form. 
Okay, generalizing the last proof that we did, we're going to look at um, the Rn version. So if f is differentiable at a, where that's an undisclosed size of vector, then it's also continuous at a. And I'm just gonna jump right into it because I don't need to motivate everything from definitions like I did before because we've already done that. So jumping right into it, I'm gonna look at the x limit as x vector approaches a vector of f evaluated at x minus f evaluated at a. I'm going to go ahead and multiply by 1 in the following way. So it's going to be x minus a over x minus a, where we're taking the magnitude of those vectors in each part. Okay, great. Now the next thing that I can do is I can go ahead and replace f of x minus f of a with what we get from this equation down here. Okay, so that's pretty easy to see because all we have to do is subtract this from both sides of the equation. So notice that's going to give us the limit as x vector approaches a vector of um, the gradient of f uh, evaluated at a dotted with x minus a plus r of x. And then all of this is over the magnitude of x minus a, and then still it's times the magnitude of x minus a because that's that one that we introduced. So we've got something like that. Now what I'll do is I'll take this term and I'll separate it from this term. And in the first term, which I'll put a yellow star on, I'm actually going to cancel the thing in the numerator with the thing in the denominator. So notice this is going to give me the limit as x vector approaches a vector of the gradient of f evaluated at a dotted with x minus a like that. Great. And then plus um, r of x over the magnitude of x minus a times the magnitude of x minus a. So we've got something like that going on. I'll go ahead and put parentheses around the whole thing because we're taking the limit of that whole thing. Now, it's not too hard to see that as x vector approaches a vector, this thing is approaching the zero vector. So we've got the gradient, um, and notice this guy is just a number because it's already been evaluated at a. So we've got just some vector of numbers dotted with the zero vector. So this part very clearly is approaching zero for that reason. And then because f is differentiable, we know this part is going to zero. And then this part is obviously going to zero because x is approaching a, so that's going to like a minus a. So when all is said and done, this th whole thing is going towards zero. So notice we have the limit of this thing equals zero, but if we remove the yellow things, that's going to give us exactly the limit as x vector approaches a vector of f of x equals f of a, which is what we needed for this thing to be continuous. Okay, I'll clean up the board and then I'm going to present a partial converse of this, um, but we won't prove it. Okay, just to finish this video off real quickly, I want to point out a partial converse of this, which is really outside of the scope of anything that we're doing for this course um, in order to prove it, but we can absolutely use it. And that says that if f, f sub x, and f sub y all exist in a neighborhood around a, b, and are continuous at a, b, then f is differentiable at a, b. So we can turn that into a vector version pretty easily. So if f and the gradient of f all exist in the neighborhood of a vector a and are continuous at a vector a, then f is differentiable at this vector a. Good. So that's a good place to stop.